Hey guys, welcome to the vlog. So today we're going to talk about the five ways you know you are ready to make money with web design. We'll start with the most obvious and we'll get to the more esoteric as we go through the list. So number one, you are comfortable with HTML5, CSS3, and JavaScript. That means you're comfortable writing the code, you're comfortable with the concepts behind the code. Now I'm talking web design, not web development. If you get into web development, you can add more programming languages. So for web design, that's the front end stuff, that's user interface design, user experience design, that's UX, is, so UI UX. So that's HTML5, CSS3. What that means is you understand all the new tags in HTML5, you understand the capabilities of the HTML5 language, and you understand CSS3, same thing. But you understand what you can do with CSS3. You understand that you can animate with it, you understand the layout processes with CSS3, etc. Now, JavaScript, you don't need to be a master at JavaScript by any means, especially if you're just doing web design, which is front-end design, but it's good to know at least a little bit of JavaScript so you understand what it can do for you in that context. Number two, you understand hosting options, domain names, setting up a server, accounts, and other foundational concepts and skills. So when it comes to web design and web development, there's much more to it than just writing code. There's the whole infrastructure around the code that you work on. So that, that means you're understanding server versus client computers, the hosting options, why you want to go cloud, why would you want to go virtual dedicated or dedicated, where uh, just standard uh, $5 a month hosting is good enough for you. You have to understand these things because your job as a web designer is to be a consultant of sorts. You're bringing not just the skill of building a site, but you also bring the knowledge all around that so that you can help the business that you're working with to help your client to decide which is the best option given their circumstances. So you have to understand these different things. Any decent course in web design and development is going to teach you this. Number three, you have to understand what the current design trends are in web design. It changes over every it changes over time. Every few years, you can have a new style that comes to the fore. Something at one point it was uh, it was about 3D buttons and then and and drop shadows and bells. That was at one point the web was like that. It became and then it became a very flat design and it became panel based design. Blah blah blah. Now I want to keep this video evergreen, so I'm not going to say what the design is. Today, what do I mean? But what do I mean? But I want to keep it evergreen. I want to teach in this video things that are going to be applicable today. I'm recording this in December 2018. This is going to be good five years from now. So I don't want to mention the design style because likely in five years the design style will change again. That being said, when it comes to to design, one surefire way to keep your design relevant for as long as possible is you go with classic styles, classic design. It's like classic furniture. There are some iconic pieces of furniture out there that I love that still look good today. They were designed in the 50s and they still look good today. Let me give you, let me give you a quick example. So what I'm showing you here are a couple of iconic chairs designed in the 50s by Charles and Ray Eames. And to this day, they look great. You see them sold everywhere. This is super high-end furniture, but they have these iconic lines and styles to them, but they never go out of style. So this is the type of thing that you want to look for in terms of your web design and development. And there are basic rules of design that apply today just as much as they applied 20 years ago. That's proper alignment, proper use of fonts in the right situations, color mixes, that sort of thing that, again, any decent course will teach you at least the basics of that. But this is going to really, understanding these things is really going to go a long way in terms of uh, establishing yourself as competent as a professional web designer. Number five, you understand when WordPress makes sense or Drupal or any other CMS or when you should design from scratch, or even when you might use a, a web builder like uh, a Wix or Squarespace. So let me address the elephant in the room. Number one, the web builders are not your competition. 
They may seem like your competition, but they're not really. You have to look at them as being just tools that you can leverage in your own web design game. Again, when you meet a client, I'm speaking to freelancers here or people who want to get into the freelance game, you have to look at all the array of options you have for developing a website as options that may be suitable given a particular client's needs. If you have a client who just a very small startup business, they only, may only have a budget of a few hundred dollars to put up a site. You're not going to design from scratch. That's where a Wix or a Squarespace might come in handy, maybe WordPress. Something simple you can get up, you know, you use WordPress with a template and bing, bang, boom, Bob's your uncle, you got a website up and you're going, well, what's the, what's the fun of that? Oh, you're making a couple hundred bucks. You have to understand, a lot of companies will start off with a cheap site and then they'll have to build up and they'll have other services that they're going to need. It could be uh, social marketing services, it could be video hookups, maybe they need you to install videos, who knows. Maybe you need, they're going to need you to help them set up their podcast. So a whole bunch of different things uh, that could spring out of a very small client that just uses a web builder. So let me tell you a quick little story. When WordPress first started rising, if you don't know, WordPress is the biggest content management system in the world today, biggest CMS in terms of popularity. So many millions and millions of sites run WordPress. Some people hate it. A lot of people hate it. Gets on my nerves too sometimes, but it's still very useful. And it is. it hit that tipping point where WordPress is now part of the fabric of the, of the web as much as GIF images. So, you know, let's just get into it. When WordPress first came out, a lot of people thought that WordPress, a lot of web designers thought that WordPress was somehow, eh, it was competition. It was going to hurt and kill web design because people were used to building websites from scratch all the time. And they thought every time some, some client wanted to put up a new article, they wanted to put up a new page, they would have to call them up and the web designer would come in and put up the page. WordPress, they don't have to do that anymore. You set it up and bing, bang, boom, they can add articles, add content as they feel if it's set up properly. And again, at first glance, superficially, that may seem like competition to you. But in, in the end, what has come to pass is that WordPress professionals, WordPress specialists, if you will, they have a huge amount of work. And because WordPress provides a lot more power and because because of, with that power, it comes a lot more complexity. It's not the perfect system. You got to understand as a WordPress, WordPress professional or a consultant, you have to understand the WordPress system, but you have to understand the ecosystem. There are a lot of plugins out there that add functionality to WordPress, but a lot of them are garbage. A lot of them could be dangerous. So you as a professional will learn what plugins are good, what are bad. Uh, what themes are good, what are themes are bad. Themes in WordPress are just the skins, just the layouts that you can grab and use and customize. Some are free, some are paid. These are all part of the tool, the tools you have in your web design toolbox. And think about it. If you're uh, somebody who's got a flower shop or a local butcher or some small business or startup, they don't know all these things about WordPress. They don't know what's going on, you know. I'll give you a case in point. I was working on uh, a side project, another business outside of a studio web, outside of this, and nothing to do with technology. And my partners, they decided, we decided, I will just start up for the blog for this particular business. We're going to put up a WordPress site. And uh, it's hard to find good WordPress people. It's very hard to find them. And so I took one of my developers, a hardcore uh Computer science, master's degree developer who's really good at writing code. He said, okay, we're going to pull you aside just to do this side project for his other business of mine. He said, okay, and you know, do it in WordPress. And he, 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 he messed up the job, not because he's incompetent, it's just that he doesn't know WordPress, even though he, is, he literally has a master's degree in computer science and he's a really good web developer, really good web developer. But doesn't know WordPress. So yeah, understanding WordPress, understanding when it makes sense to use WordPress or maybe your Drupal on a rare occasion, understanding when to build from scratch, understanding when Wix or Squarespace makes sense. These are, uh, this knowledge is what you should be able to bring to the table as a web designer, as a web consultant. It's really important because at the end of the day, 
the good web consultant is going to be able to pick which one is best for the client at that particular stage in the client's uh, business life cycle, if you will. Number five, you know the strategies or ways to include multimedia into sites, audio, video, images, whether you do local embeds, YouTube, Vimeo. This may seem like kind of a weird thing out of left field, but it really isn't because just because you can write code and build a responsive website using uh, in Bootstrap or the latest frameworks, you still have to learn a little bit about this specialization because it's so prevalent today. Video embeds and sites are very common today. Audio embeds, podcast. There's different ways to do it. There's local hosting versus remote hosting. Uh, what's a cinemagraph? Why would you want to use a cinemagraph? Why would you want to use a video for one of the main panels in the background? How would you properly implement that so you won't crash everybody's browsers, etc., etc., etc.? This is kind of a specialization, but it's it's very common, and uh, I can tell you, successful websites have really good visual components to it. And these days, in the day of uh, high-speed internet and soon 5G is going to be rolling out. Things like video and audio and all this kind of stuff in sites is just like, well, today it's par for the course. So you have to understand when it makes sense to use a YouTube baby. So for example, a client may want to put up a bunch of videos on how they prepare some dishes at the restaurant. As an example, you don't want to local host that most of the time because it's heavy duty on the bandwidth. So if you're using very you know cheap hosting, that might cause problems. So the best strategy is to just set up either a Vimeo account with uh, some videos you can do for free in that situation, or you can set up a YouTube account. And of course, that's always free, but then you got to deal with YouTube ads and stuff. So there's pros and cons. And you got to understand when it makes sense to use Vimeo, Vimeo free or Vimeo pro, which is a small fee per month, or maybe use YouTube, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sure there's other options out there as well. You know, if you look at it from uh, also a web marketing point of view, it might make sense to use YouTube just in terms of how it will help uh, get an audience for your client as well as they post their videos on YouTube. And then they use those YouTube videos to embed on their site. Anyway, this is just one scenario. I'm not saying this is the way everybody's going to do it, but I'm just giving you an example of how all these things I'm talking about. Think about all the things, the five things they listed. There's code in all of this, of course, because you need the coding. You need the HTML5, the CS3, the CSS3, maybe some JavaScript on occasion to implement this stuff, to put it into place. But at the end of the day, a lot of what I'm talking about has nothing to do with code in the sense that it's, it's all outside of code. It's all around the code. So uh, when you see courses out there, but they just teach you code, it's like teaching a small sliver of what you need to know. So uh, there you have it. I hope this video is useful. I'm just trying out another uh, setup here. I got to get rid of this wire. And uh, I hope you liked the video. Bye-bye.